Uh, so without further ado, please join me in welcoming Preeta Meyer and Laura Fair, the conveners of this particular symposium, as you will hear much more from them in terms of their introductory remarks about the content that is to follow. Thank you so much. Welcome. Thank you so much, and welcome, everybody. Um, I just want to make a couple of very brief remarks, and I want to thank everyone who's traveled to come here and present today. I also really uh, want to express my gratitude to the Africa Institute and everybody who has made it possible for us to all come together over the next couple of days, and hopefully for years to come. I think Prita and I, I, I think I speak for both of us when I say that we are very honored to have been asked to pull together a conference of 15 people, uh, our favorite, maybe uh, scholars that we have respected for years and years and to be able to pull people together. Um, to rekindle some friendships where people have known each other but haven't seen each other in years, um, and to hopefully initiate some new dialogues and collaborations, interdisciplinary work um, across fields, across continents, and we hope that that will continue on for many years. Uh, Preeti and I are not presenting papers at this particular conference. Um, our task is to pull together a special issue of Monsoon from the papers that are presented here. Um, and there are 15 or so presentations, 13, 15. Um, but our task, we feel, will be made easier by the fact that after years as professors, we know that ourselves and our colleagues are actually worse than the undergraduates we constantly complain about in terms of getting their papers done and in on time. So, <laughs> um, but we do encourage you to please make your best effort to pull together your papers and to submit them um, to Satan or, um, so that we have something to work with. Um, but do not feel pressed if you have other things that you need to do. It will make our job easier, actually, if half of you don't turn in your papers <laughs> in the end. But we will do our best to weave some colorful threads and pull the papers together and to put them together in a wonderful issue of Monsoon. Um, the monsoon, as you all know, refers to a weather pattern shifting winds in the Indian Ocean. Um, in recent years, the monsoons have been very irregular and erratic. Uh, the rains that typically accompany the monsoons are not falling as they historically have been. Um, in fact, in East Africa, for the last four or five years, there's been incredible drought. Last week, while the Emirates was hosting the global conference on, um, on COP, East Africa was inundated with rains of historic proportions. Um, a season that should have been marked by very, we call them the small rains in East Africa, were actually deluges that flooded. Um, many, many um, people. So I guess one thing that we can all think about as we participate in the conference and leave the conference as well is to, with the new year upon us, to make some sort of individual resolutions about things that we individually can do to address the climate um, and climate change. I think that and none of the presenters that at least Preeta and I invited were invited to participate in the COP conference uh, last week um, because typically that is the venue for politicians and policymakers, people who deal with carbon. Typically people think of arts and culture, which is what we're here to talk about, as like the icing on the cake. But I think we will see as you listen and engage with the papers that are presented individually, draw connections between them in the coming days, 
that arts and culture are really fundamental in terms of allowing us to imagine alternative ways of thinking about wealth, about prosperity, and about communities in the past and how they uh, valued and nurtured um, what, they, what was considered the good life. So those are a few things that I think we can think about in addition to the, the richness of the particular individual papers. Preeta? Greetings, everyone. Laura and I are delighted to be here today and to have you here today. And we very much look forward to hearing uh, the exciting research of our 13 invited speakers. While ranging, in term, while ranging in terms of topics, their contributions reveal how the arts and cultures of the Western Indian Ocean world transcend boundaries, both physical and conceptual. I first want to thank uh, those who have been the stewards and visionaries of this project. I'm grateful to Professor Salah Hassan, and I am especially, especially thankful to Satan Al Hassan, who is really the captain steering us to safe waters, to use a nautical um, overused metaphor. Um, also, of course, I want to thank Rogaya uh, Abu Sharaf, Uday Chandre, and uh, Jeremy Presthold, who developed the Africa Institute season of which this symposium is a part of, which as you know, is called Thinking the Archipelago, Africa's Indian Ocean Islands. A brief description of this, um, of their rationale for the season is available on the Institute's website and I actually really encourage you all to look at it because it's actually a very capacious mini uh, manifesto that I've had a great pleasure uh, in engaging with and thinking with as we were developing uh, this symposium. Now, the symposium brings together diverse fields and disciplines, and together we hope today to re reposition the Indian Ocean world as a vexing and productive space to question received ideas about what it even means to study art and culture in relationship to something as everly mercurial as the oceanic and the archipelago. Certainly Indian Ocean archipelagos demand that we let go of land and familiar landings. Because even while the humanities disciplines have long focused on globalization, diaspora, the study of the arts and material culture tend to be grounded in a trenchant terra-centrism, which is often, of course, also useful. For example, art historians tend, and I am speaking about myself here, really, because I am trained as an uh, art historian, we, but we tend to focus on African, Kenyan, or Indian artists, or we deploy hyphens such as Afro-Asian, which are of course not only about geography and territory, but they are haunted by the specter of territorial defined autochtony and ethno-territorial exclusion, which always also raise questions of authenticity and indigeneity. Now, many of our invited participants are not art historians, which is actually very productive. In fact, I think we are a minority and we have an array of humanities and social science scholars with us. But I believe what characterizes everyone's work is a exciting transdisciplinarity. In fact, Laura and I work uh, hard to not only bring together a truly international group of scholars, but that they uh, all have very different projects that foreground very different, even dissonant uh, analytic frameworks. While there, are, well, there have been other symposia and books on the arts of these regions, and some of them have been organized and co-authored by some of our participants, um, this symposium um, is an exciting platform, I believe, for rethinking some of the by now canonical ideas 
put forth by Indian Ocean Studies. For one, in this symposium, I think we can really pay attention to the productive frictions and tensions between scholars who focus on imaginaries and textual production, where ocean and archipelagos are representational spaces, spaces and those who center materiality, matter, and the physical making of things and um, historicity. I hope we can unravel and re-knit other transient Indian Ocean studies truisms that by now have become familiar narratives. What if we move beyond elitist topics such as cosmopolitanism and celebratory narratives of seaborne trade and travel? While archipelagos can be celebrated for an openness to others, and transcultural connectivity, they are, they are also shaped by, experience, by embodied experiences of violence and subjection. There's no port city or island connected to the African Indian Ocean world that is not touched by slavery, racism, and ethnocentrism. What role do the arts and built environments and uh, uh, literary works play in these histories? What comes into analytical view if we center the fact that many mercantile and transcultural aesthetics were also about othering? What is the significance of the properties of maritime environments, waves, sea surfaces, or sea floors in the making of form? What comes into analytical view when we think of the Western Indian, when we think of Western Indian Ocean littorals as African peripherals, as opposed to continuing to focus on undoing colonialist representations of Africa as peripheral to Euro-American phenomena. That is, what would it mean to unapologetically embrace the peripheral? Also, the Western Indian Ocean is a site of millennia old South-South relations, where constantly seeking to undo Eurocentrism also looks really anachronistic or even a bit misplaced. This would also lead us to ask how the arts and material cultures of archipelagos and port cities exceed prevailing definitions of identitarian categories used to talk about art and artists. How, does, how do ideas of indigeneity work on islands where everyone is a immigrant, or in port cities where people trace their heritage to multiple societies? How long does it take for a foreign to become local? From the vantage point of littorals, questions of origins seem provincial and irrelevant. Or is it the opposite? Because contemporary national heritage politics often reassert the importance of finding the first, the original, the ancestral. Relatedly, on Indian Ocean Islands, including the Comoros and Mauritius, and we actually have four presentations that focus on Mauritius, interestingly, um, in the symposium, African ancestry is invariably expressed, concealed, valorized, denigrated in mercurial ways. This brings us to another through line connecting many of the papers. What are the stakes of centering blackness and Africanness in the Western Indian Ocean? Littorals, littorals and archipelagos are more than mere conduits that facilitate processes of localization or Africanization but calling on and honoring ancestral heritage matters because of long histories of sublimation. Yet many of the arts of this region, region refuse singular labels while also exposing, exposing the inadequacy of racialized concepts such as hybridity. It is in fact hard to make sense of art movements defined by multidirectional trajectories or of layered artworks that embody the entanglements of Africa and Asia. Yet this can also be perceived as disconcerting or paradoxical. 
even if uh, if Indian Ocean art is always in an is always an entanglement of other places, then what is it? Does it even make sense to call forth such continental territories as Asia and Africa? Here I um, am also very much inspired by the work by uh, one of our presenters, Nidhi Mahajan, who has uh, done multi-sided research with sailors transversing the Western Indian Ocean, which has led her to think through, quote, the relations between ship, land, and sea. She calls, uh, she does, pra she, she practices a method she calls archipelic uh, ethnography, which is, quote, and I love this phrase, wet, wet with uh, sea, but still attuned to the dynamics of land. And this uh, brings me to the point of uh, that even for diasporic communities, the ties that bind are about relations with land. Even if that land is terraqueous, um, such as the mangrove forests of the Kenya Lamu archipelago, terraqueous environments and ecosystems are not only key resources sustaining local livelihoods, but they are a multi-sensorial presence that inspire artists, patrons, performers, and builders in myriad ways. So even this very uh, preliminary sketch should already signal to you that the Western Indian Ocean world is one of the most dynamic places of the world, where diverse peoples, ideas, and materials converge, but also transform each other often making something so new that they no longer have any need to acknowledge one's fragments, origins somewhere else. Thank you. <laughs>